In the design and administration of private IP networks, we are often asked to join secured networks to expose internal resources. This could be for a number of reasons, from partnerships, M&A activity, or network consolidation. In this demonstration, we'll focus on the extranet use case. Specifically, we're going to look at how to solve the problem of joining networks and exposing specific resources that may need to be accessed across both networks. Using Nuage Network's virtualized network services, we will show how we can solve the extranet challenge. We will focus on three different network scenarios where we will be exposing resources between network domains and will implement different network address translation techniques to meet these requirements. To demarcate these topologies and lines of network authority, we are going to use the following definitions to describe each of the entities. The provided domain. This is the entity that has overall ownership of the extranet solution. As the provider, I would have administrative authority over the Nuage platform and could be interconnecting to many other networks within the same extranet solution. The customer domain. This is the entity that is going to interconnect to the provider network, either to A, provide access to resources inside the customer network to the provider network, B, access resources inside the provider network, or C, some combination of both. In our first extranet scenario, we have the following network requirement. Suppliers of the jeans company, that is, the button and zipper company, need connectivity to the jeans company network. The jeans company has validated its IP address space and is sure that there is no conflict between it and its suppliers. However, it has no control over the supplier networks, and it is possible that the button and zipper companies will overlap. Jeans company also does not want to import and advertise any foreign routes in its network. In this particular case, it's a one-way traffic requirement, that is, the jeans company does not require any access to the zipper or button company's networks. To support the one-way traffic requirement, we will implement port address translation. For this, we will need to define and allocate address ranges that will be presented to the provider domain as the translated source address for each of the customer domains. I've chosen the following two networks such that button company will be translated to 10.0.33.0 and zipper company will be translated to 10.0.32.0. Now let's take a look at the configuration required to support this. We've already deployed our domains, one for the jeans company as the provider domain, and one for each of the zipper company and button company sites participating in the extranet. Taking note, we can see here that the button and zipper addresses do overlap, but jeans are unique. Our first step is to advertise the provider domain network, which will be left untouched with no address translation to each of the customer domains. We do this by adding a special type of static route using the overlay address translation flag with the destination of the jeans company 192.168.100.0 network. Next, we are going to link the provider and customer domains using an overlay address translation domain link. The domain link will state that any traffic from the source domain, in this case the button company, to the destination domain, the jeans company, will use overlay address translation on button company addresses when passing between domains. Finally, we add an address pool. This will be the 10.0 address ranges that we allocated to each of the button and zipper company sites. We can test the connectivity from each of the extranet sites to the Jeans company server. From a client machine on each of the button and zipper company networks respectively, we can check our local IP address, then can see that both clients have the same address. From each of these sites, we can ping the remote Jeans company server, which has an IP address of 192.168.100.2. Success, we have connectivity to the jeans company domain. Now let's check the source address of the requests coming from each of the customer domains. Looking at VSD, we can see that the PAT rule states that any traffic source from the button company and destined for the jeans company will be translated into 10.0.33.168. To check this, I have a server running in the jeans company site that is going to dynamically display the source and destination address of the request that was sent to it. Generating a request from the button company, we see a source address of 10.0.33.168, which is exactly what we expected. Now, checking the configured source address of the zipper company network, we can see that packets should be sent to the jeans company network with a source of 10.0.32.1. Generating a request from the zipper company, we can see packets arriving with the expected source address. From this, we can see that we have successfully extended the jeans company network via a one-way PAT translation into the button and zipper company networks. However, what happens if the provider, in this case the jeans company, needs to connect to a resource in each of the extranet sites? Going back to our high-level topology, we now have a server in both the button and zipper company domains that we need to access. So the jeans company domain needs a way to deal with the overlapping address space that is running in each of the extranet customer domains. 
To solve this, we are going to add a one-to-one -one NAT rule into our overlay address translations. We will create a static translation between the internal or private IP of the server that is only accessible inside its own domain, and an address that comes from our address pool that is writable in the provider domain, i.e. 10.0.32 and 10.0.33. So let's create a static one-to-one -one NAT rule for the button and zipper company domains. Our private IP will be the actual host IP, that is 192.168.101.2, and the public IP will be from the overlay address pools we previously configured. For the button company, it is 10.0.33.2, and for the zipper company, it will be 10.0.32.2. Now that we have configured the one-to-one -one NAT rule, we can test connectivity from the jeans company server to each of the button and zipper company sites. We do this by launching a ping to the public IP address for the button and zipper company servers. We can see that we have connectivity to both. Let's check the source and destination of the packet as it reaches each of the button and zipper company networks. Again, I have a server deployed in each that will tell us the source and destination IPs. Connecting to the button company site first, we can see that the source IP remains unchanged from the jeans company server, that is 192.168.100.2, and the destination IP is the private IP inside the button company domain, that is 192.168.101.2 even though the request was launched at the public IP of 10.0.33.2. Likewise, from the jeans company to the zipper company, we get a similar result. In both cases, we are requesting a response from a server with the IP address of 192.168.101.2, and using overlay address translation NAT, are able to route and handle those requests appropriately. The techniques we have used up to this point are primarily available to us as we have been able to route the provider domain into each of the customer domains where access is required. However, what about cases where this is not possible? The simplest reason for this restriction is that all IP addresses could overlap, but again, it does not have to be the driving objective. It could be that we do not want to advertise any foreign networks inside the customer or provider domains. So in this case, we are going to introduce a new technique which is called bidirectional NAT. In scenario 3, we have a similar setup to scenario 1 and 2, however in this case the button and zipper company customer domains are running the same IP address space as the jeans company provider domain. Similar to scenario 2, there are resources that need to be accessed in both the provider and customer domains. To support this, we will now need to allocate a public address to the jeans company provider domain, along with public addresses for the two customer domains. If we look at the NAT operation when the customer domain wants to access the provider domain, it'll send the request to the public IP of the provider domain, that is 10.0.31.2, with the source address of 192.168.100.2. The bidirectional NAT domain link will translate the source of the packet to the customer domain public IP, that is 10.0.35.2 for the button company, and 10.0.34.2 for the zipper company. At the same time, it'll translate the destination address to the private IP of the provider domain. In the reverse path, that is from the provider to the customer domain, requests will be sent to the public IP of each customer domain, that is 10.0.35.2 for the button company and 10.0.34.2 for the zipper company. The bidirectional NAT domain link will translate the source from the provider private IP to its public IP, that is 192.168.100.2 to 10.0.31.2 and the destination address to each of the respective customer domain private IPs. To support this scenario, I have deployed two new domains, one for the button company and one for the zipper company. The jeans company remains unchanged. However, we can see that all three domains are configured with the same IP subnets, that is 192.168.100.0. Let's take a look at the domain linking configuration required to support bidirectional NAT. We can see here that we have a new domain link type of BIDA, which in this case is short for bidirectional NAT. To support the source and destination address translation, we will need to provide translation pools for both directions, that is, provider to customer and customer to provider. We also need to establish our one-to-one -one NAT translation rules for both directions. From provider to customer, we will translate the jeans company server address of 192.168.100.2 to the public address of 10.0.31.2. On the customer to provider side, we will translate the button company server address of 192.168.100.2 to its public address of 10.0.35.2. It must be noted here that even though I'm using one-to-one -one NAT, we can also establish PAT rules if we desired for both directions. If we check the zipper company domain, we can see that we also have a bidirectional NAT domain link configured with the appropriate source pools and one-to-one -one NAT rules in place. 
Now that bidirectional NAT is configured based on our Scenario 3 extranet connectivity requirements, we can test between the customer and provider domains. First, let's check the customer to provider direction. We can see that the address of the server in each of the button and zipper company sites is the same, 192.168.100.2. Simultaneously, we'll launch a ping to the public IP of the Jeans company server, that is 10.0.31.2. We can see that both customer domains are able to reach the Jeans company provider domain. Now let's check the provider to customer. Again, checking the address of the Jeans company server, we can see that it has the same address, that is 192.168.100.2 as the button and zipper company servers. Checking connectivity to the zipper company first, we will ping its public IP address of 10.0.34.2. Now the button company by pinging its public IP address of 10.0.35.2. Success, we are able to connect from the provider to the customer and from the customer to provider, meeting our Scenario 3 extranet requirements. Again, using a web server placed in each of the domains, we can check to see the source and destination address of each request as it reaches the destination domain. First up, the button company to the jeans company. We can see that it has a source of 10.0.35.2, which is what we configured in our one to one NAT rule. Now the zipper company to the jeans company. Again, we see the source of the public IP for the zipper company, that is 10.0.34.2. Checking the reverse direction from the provider to the customer domains. In both cases, we should expect to see the source address matching the public IP of the jeans company, that is 10.0.31.2. First up, a request from the jeans company to the button company server. Our source address is correct. Now, from the jeans company to the zipper company server, again, the source is what we expected. And with that, our extranet is validated and complete. What we have seen through the three extranet scenarios is that Nuage Network's VNS provides a level of control and flexibility to handle the complex requirements that extranet presents. SDN, and specifically SD-WAN, opens up new areas for the management and support of complex networking requirements like extranet. With centralized management, provisioning and control, it is well positioned to address the complex nature that extranets inherently present and ensure that we have a seamless routing and security policy in place to safely interconnect networks and expose only the specific resources we intend. For more information, visit nuagenetworks.net forward slash VNS. Thank you.